Welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We are thrilled you're here. I'm thrilled you're here because today I have one of our favorite, favorite guests, Jack Nacho Alato. Let's fire up the show today. Let's do it. All right. Well, <laughs> Jack Ignacio. I like Nacho. Nacho's the best. Um, Alato. You know, Jack is, I'm going to brag on you a bit, um, a lot of it. Jack is a CFRE, but more importantly than that, he's one of the masterminds in this nation who's formulated some amazing training. And before we end today, I'd love to kind of talk about that because the CFRE nation is such a challenge and it's such a pinnacle for so many people in their career. And um, you have, I mean, I know people that took your classes, Jack, before I ever met you. Okay, I don't think oh. I've ever told you that, but I do know of your legacy in this space. And so I think it's a really cool thing that we get you on to talking about this. But enough about you. Yes, enough about me. I'm <laughs> blushing. You can't see it. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get on and let's see what we've got cooking today with our questions. Because, you know, we always have interesting questions that come in. And those questions really come from across the country, and they are supported by our presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, where Jack hails from, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Okay, you know, Jack, I was telling you this in the green room, last Tuesday, we hit our 1,000th show, which blows my mind. Um, 1,000 of anything is a lot. I'm just going to say it. Um, but you can catch up with us on our app and streaming broadcast podcasts. We will meet you where you are when you have an issue or you need some thought leadership. So definitely check us out. Okay, Jack, you know, name withheld. Super important. I'm going to man up and tell you, I took this person's name off. I do that a lot when I think, I mean, St. Louis is a big city, but still, I don't want to get anyone in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So the question is this, I'm trying to get my nonprofit to invest in branded branding note cards, specifically A2, which are a standard thank you note card size. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like this size, right? It's the perfect size. My CEO thinks they are a foolish expense. And as someone in development, I believe this is an essential tool. How do I convince him to do this? Yeah, I love the idea of a branded postcard. I think it, let's talk brands for a minute, Julia. Yeah. Even more than a branded postcard, you know what I love for a nonprofit? A brand. I love for nonprofits to have a brand. A brand is what distinguishes you from other nonprofits in your community, especially those nonprofits who are working in the same space. The brand is your personality. It's your unique style. It's your the it's the thing that makes you unique. It is what is most recognizable about your organization. Yeah. It's your particular attributes, the yeah. way you do business. If I told you, Julia, that in the community, there was a family displaced by fire and they had no shelter, the brand that comes to the mind is the American Red Cross. Yes. Yeah. If we talked about cancer, the brand that comes to mind is the American Cancer Society. And yes. when I think of prevention of drunk driving, I think of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mm -hmm. All of these brands come to the top of my mind whenever I think of the uniqueness that they bring to the work that they do. And the most important thing and the, at the end of this question is really what's important to me. How do I convince them? How He or she thinks that it will support their fundraising efforts. You want to remain at the top of your donor's mind. And that's what brands do. They put you at the top of the mind of, uh, of the donor and the prospect. When a donor is thinking about making a gift, we talk about this in cost selling all the time, you want to be on at the top of their mind. And brands help you do that. 
So, Jack, I know you have an illustrious career as a successful fundraiser and, and of course, you know, a thought leader and an educator. But when you were in the trenches raising money, did you, Jack Nacho Alato, write handwritten notes? Did you use that in your oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I used I used yeah. uh, note cards with our brand on the front, the name of the organization or our logo or something that was very distinguishable. And I always wrote handwritten notes. And I know, I know when I talk to my niece and nephew, Julia, they say cursive. We don't know how to read cursive. Right. They have to get their parents to translate it. So even if you right. print, it's so personal. And think about the double whammy you give to your donors and your prospect. There's your brand on the front. They open it up, they see your brand, and then they see this beautiful printed or cursive handwritten note. What better way to bring a donor closer to your organization, to build and strengthen a relationship with a donor than by doing a handwritten note? Right. Well, name withheld from St. Louis, you know, you should be in the range of 50 cents a note card, and this is fully branded with a branded envelope, um, maybe as high as $2.50. Um, you know, I think that we do not ask enough. I mean, in the nonprofit sector, we're always asking our donors and our partners, but I don't think there's any problem with going to a local printer and saying, hey, I need this. Can you get me a discount? How low can you go on this? How can you get me you know, to, to have this, um, because this is a critical, I mean, to me, Jack, this, if you look at what the tools are, this is in the toolbox. I mean, you know, your website, your email, your business cards, you know, your LinkedIn, your A2 note cards, no yeah. joke. This is yeah. like one of those things. So, um, I think you've got to do it. And I, I appreciate doing like note cards. That's great. But I think you need to do branded note cards. Yeah. I don't think it's enough just to go out and get Hallmark. Right. This is absolutely, pretty. absolutely. Your brand is you. It's your uniqueness. And so use it everywhere you can. Yeah. Well, sorry to get all up in your business name with help. <laughs> I mean, come on. Nacho, really? Nacho y Julia are very, very. That's right. <laughs> fired up about this. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Janelle in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, Jack, this question came in and I wanted to save it for you because I was really looking forward to what your comment was. And Janelle writes in, how do you feel about asking for money over a meal in a public place? I'm debating about changing my strategy when it comes to making an ask. Thanks for your help. Yeah. So uh, here is, it, it's, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. It matters how the prospect and the donor feel about it. So if your prefer, if your pr prospect's preferred place of meeting is in a restaurant or in a coffee shop or in it, wherever, it's really important to use what, you know, to be donor centric. You want to meet where they want to meet. And one of the things you could ask them early on and you're building a relationship with them is where would you like us to meet to talk about okay. our what we're going to do but i want to add a caveat to that so i'm you know putting together with angela barnes a presentation for afp icon and one of the things that we've i've noticed in my research is that you don't want to meet in like a donor's home unless you have another fundraiser with you so there are some places where i would recommend you not meet it unless you really know the person really well, uh, because we're seeing that, uh, you know, there are there is some sexual harassment out there in private places. So I would like to keep it in a public place. You know, Jack, that I I know that's something we're going to bring you on uh, with Angela and we're going to have a, an episode just about this research that you've done. But I really appreciate um your starting point, ask the donor, the prospect. That's like, duh. And, yeah. and you know, you could still, that. right. And you could say no to some places, yeah. you know, unless, you know, I mean, if it's what it, you know, you could say no. You could say, you know, maybe a more appropriate place is my office in, right. in the nonprofit organization. But I would, I would feel them out. Where, where do you like to talk with me? And definitely bring them to visit your organization. 
You know, Jack, it's so funny. I was thinking about this um, and I hadn't thought about this for years. Um, and one of the first boards I served, um, I was asked to accompany the CEO um, to make an ask. And it was a, it was a, you know, a sizable donor um, and they had been a donor for a long time and, and we were moving into a capital campaign, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so the, I said, well, what's the amount going to be? And the CEO said, well, it's going to be a million dollars. And I was like, oh my God, holy crap. <laughs> and she's like, well, he totally has it. And he, you know, it, it's just more of a formality. Um, and he likes to go to super salad. <laughs> and it was like a, it was a chain like b salad buffet. And I was like, oh no, we're going to, I will take him to X, Y, Z, like la di da. And she's like, no, Julia, he, he likes the idea of our stewardship. And he had a horrible, a horrible child and was always hungry. And so for him, <laughs> when he sees this like buffet of nutritious food, this really strikes a chord with him and so what exactly what you just said I had never really thought of it is where does that donor fit where do they want to fit mm -hmm. it's really smart and and you know I've been invited to to lunch by a donor and it was so loud so there are some things that we want to make sure we consider I you know I'm annoyed in a small place with a lot where I'm yelling at somebody. So you pick your place, but definitely consult with the donor where they would like to meet you. Well, and you know, Jack, the other thing too, that I always am concerned about is privacy and like that, that whole thing of like, you know, especially if you're in a small community, I mean, I live in the fifth largest city in America, but in so many ways, we're a small community and you just don't go out to lunch where you're walking through the door and you don't see people and you're, hey, hi, you know, and all this. And so then it's kind of a weird thing, I think, when you're, you know, you're going to be soliciting somebody. So. Absolutely. Anyway. OK, well, that was fascinating. Let's go on to um, Janet from Port St. Lucie, Florida. Janet writes, we are working up a new sponsorship donor deck and our team is split on this. Do we, oh, this is so interesting. Do we use more data points or emotions in our pitch deck? Big new discussion. Yeah, I, I love the question. And so, I, you know, I, I look at it from two perspectives. The first is from individuals, and you could get sponsorships from individuals. You should be asking individuals for sponsorships or from corporate or business uh, sponsorship. Here's the thing about both of those entities. As you build a relationship, and you know, cause selling is a relationship building model of fundraising. As you're building those relationships with either individuals or corporations or, or businesses, you will come to understand whether it's numbers, data, numbers, how many people did you serve last year? or whether it's an emotional thing maybe a storyteller a story about a a story about a beneficiary or a client which will elicit a, an emotional response so here's your job as a, Janet your job as a fundraiser is to find out what motivates your donor are they motivated by the rational things like data points and numbers or are they motivated by emotions or most likely by both. Now with a corporation or a business, they might be more motivated by data points. Yeah. For example, many of their employees may use your services. If you're an animal shelter, maybe they come and adopt pets, cats and dogs from your animal shelter or a hospital. Maybe they use the emergency room or physicians there or whatever it is. Or maybe they volunteer for your organization. Yeah. They may ask you numbers like how many of our employees are volunteers or how many of our employees are, you know, yeah. uh, donors to your organization or whatever it is. Or maybe they're just motivated by social responsibility mm -hmm. for, towards the community. And here's another thing which I've looked at uh, in, in trying to answer this question. Some corporations are, and businesses, they want to co-brand with you. Yeah, maybe they want politicians to see that they are supporters of community organizations. 
So if finding out these things is, is a complicated thing, it's not that complicated. You just get to know that your, your, your donors, your corporations, your individuals, and then you give them the data or the emotional stories that they want. So Jack, let me um, ask you my own question on top of Janet's question. And that is, you know, we keep hearing more and more about this next generation of donors that are, you know, the millennials, oh. the Gen Z, and they are much more attracted to impact and to data and the metrics than they are their parents or grandparents on the emotional side. Are you seeing this or do you think that this is a yeah. blur? Are you? No, okay. I think it's yeah. definitely, you mentioned millennials. Millennials want to be involved as volunteers. Mm -hmm. I don't think baby boomers are that interested in volunteering. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're older, they're they maybe older. more sedentary, but millennials want to see impact. They want to see the data points. If you are housing the unhoused, they may ask you how many people did you provide shelter for last month or last year? And they want to be involved. They want to be a volunteer in your organization. They want, and I love that about millennials and, and other generations that really want to have an involvement in the organization. And it's just so important. It is. And I, I think as we know, I mean, the the more you have a relationship on that campus or with that cause or, you know, whatever it is, I think that it's just, it links you to an organization's mission in a way that is just so hard to get any other way. I mean, getting a piece of mail or an email or, you know, a pen or mug in the mail isn't going to be nearly as impactful as serving, you know, in a food, yes. kitchen, food pantry or, you know, attending a, a, a cultural performance. I mean, yeah. Or, you know, you know I, when I worked in healthcare, I used to say you 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 can't leave the hospital if you go to a neonatal intensive care unit or uh, a, you know a birthing center. Those little babies in those bassinets—it's such an important thing to do. Yeah, it really is. Well, Janet, I hope this helps, and I, I really like Jack's advice on this. I think it's super super important. Okay. Um, Let's go to this as a completely different question. This comes to us from Henry in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And he writes, we used to be super strict and consistent about running campus tours every Saturday. Now with COVID slowing down, we're trying to determine if we should return to this model of fundraising or not. I think of this as, um, you know, Terry Axelrod's Benavon model, you know, oh, get, get people yeah. like, to the campus, to the tour, tour in a box. If you didn't have a campus, you know, get get that relationship started, and then you know navigate down the field to it towards an ask. I say absolutely. Oh, you See, do. Okay. I, I I seeing firsthand your work and the physical environment in which you do your work is a great cultivation tool for prospective donors at a college campus or high school, whatever this uh, educational students, students coming. I, you know, I mean, I look at my nieces and nephews, they visited college campuses. They talked with students that firsthand, you know, approach was so important. I remember way back when I used to write grants mm -hmm. uh, for early in my career, I used to end every grant with an invitation for the program officer to come and visit our physical environment. And I used to say something like this, Julia, this grant proposal and this letter, this cover letter could never portray the intensity of our work. Instead, I would like to invite you to come and see firsthand the important work we do in the community. That simple sentence, and I would give them my phone number, have a contact me, they call me up and they say, you know what, I'm going to take you up on your offer to come and visit your organization. And it's just such an important way, a cultivation tool, and I highly recommend it. You know what, I love that. I love that approach, Jack. I think it's genuine. I think the thing too that impresses me about that is that you are kind of saying, I have nothing to hide and right. maybe this won't work, but something else will, or it's it's like a, it's, um, it's like, 
a relationship cultivation as opposed to just that grant transaction. And transparency. Yeah. Trans you're saying, come and visit us. We're, and meet our, maybe meet our beneficiaries, maybe meet our clients, pet a dog, look at dog, you know, scratch a cat, whatever it is, you know, it's such an important way to, for them to see firsthand and, and for them to understand what your cause is and what your mission is and, and see firsthand how you are advancing that mission. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, let's go to um, another question that name withheld, and this comes to us from Henderson, Nevada. Our new board chair thinks we should have at least one employee on the board. This would be an actual voting member. I have never heard of this. Have you? So I have never heard of an actual voting member as an employee because that line between, yeah. pop, you know, the board as an independent organization and a policymaking board and staff as the implementers of the policy that the board enacts. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. I've worked for organizations where the CEO or the executive director was an ex officio member of the board. Mm -hmm. They attended the board meetings. Mm -hmm. They didn't vote, but they, they were there. They talked about things. They gave reports and things like that. I've attended many board me meetings, mm -hmm. but here's the thing that I recommend. You know, every organization does that board needs assessment. What do you need? Here's the thing that I really think is important. And I see this trend. People are talking about this. We're going to talk about it next Thursday is putting beneficiaries of the services yeah. and the clients on the board, yeah. get them on the board, incorporate them into in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. I worked in organizations that were working in communities of color and there were no people of color yeah. on the board. Yeah. So it's really important for us to be community centric. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you know, my first response is absolutely not, because this is a conflict of interest. I mean, a legal COI policy that you are asked to report on to the IRS every year. Um, and it is a conflict of interest. I, I think ex officio is a super powerful thing going both ways for the board, for the staff. They should be there. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can understand where this board chair is coming from. They want to probably know more about, you know, the organization and it's well-intentioned, but this is not the, the fiduciary nor proper stewardship method. It just isn't. And so, um, yeah, don't, don't fall into that. Trap. I agree. I it's, agree. It's just not good. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry to like rush you along, but I didn't want to leave this moment together because gosh darn it, it seems like forever since I've been on the show with you, but that can't be. But anyway, I I want you to spend a little bit of time talking about what the CFRE training is coming up. Um, yeah. We're going to be at AFP in Toronto for people that yeah. might want to meet you. Can yes. you kind of just talk about what some of those trainings are looking like coming up? So, our, so first off with our mutual friend, Mui Kawaja. Yeah. He and I, we're going to do a Muslim study group specifically for Muslims who are involved in fundraising. And already we have 19 people in that group. It's listed at the CFRE.org website. You could join it. We, I'm excited to do it. It's going to be in the evenings on Wednesdays. It's going to be much longer. My traditional study, and that starts April 17th. Okay. The next okay. study group that is four Saturdays. And I already have 89 people signed up is going to start April 20th. And it goes from 9 a.m. until noon Pacific time. And it goes through, I think, May 11th is the fourth Saturday. So definitely anyone, both of these study groups are free. They're free. So avail yourself of it. It's it's really worth it. And I will be in Toronto with Angela Barnes. We're going to present a paper on Saturday morning. Uh, I'm sorry, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. So if you're there, come and say hello to me. I I love to meet previous uh, CFRE study group participants, of which, by the way, Angela Barnes is one. I love it. I love it. Well, I you know, it's funny, Jack, again, in the green room uh, chatter, we were talking. I knew about you before I ever met you because um, I, I have known folks that have taken you know, your, your trainings um, and your study groups. And so 
um, it was super cool when I got to meet you because I was like, oh my God, he's like super famous because I knew that, you know, you, you were doing- I'm blushing. Stuff. I'm blushing again. <laughs> no, I mean, I, so I was like, wow, that's super cool. So I think this is a, a great thing. And and um, again, I love that you're going to do this with Muhi. Um, we are in Ramadan right now. We had Muhi on uh, for Ask and Answered last week. And I we actually, saw that. I yeah, saw that. We, and... we spent a little bit of time, uh, you know, me, I'm always like pestering him with questions, but bless his heart. He's always so kind and so right. gentle. To I, I love the man. I've known him for almost 10 years. Yeah. He was in my study group and he, of course, is a CFRE. So uh, he, he's he's a great guy. I've followed his career. I know he's in Florida now, so I'm going to yeah. miss him. I'm not going to, he's not going to be close here in California, but he's a great guy. Yeah, he really is. Well, Jack Alato, CFRE, you're a great guy. And you're also a trainer with Fundraising Academy, National University. Check out fundraising-academy.org. And you can learn all about the amazing tools. Most of that of these, these teaching units are free. And so it is remarkable information. You know, I always say, Jack, if I had had this in my life, you know, 40 years ago, I would have raised millions more, literal, no joke, millions more in my community because I would have had tools. Yeah. And, but important. you know what? What organization wouldn't love you, Julia, on their board? And that's yeah. that's where you made such a contribution to the nonprofit sector. And um, you have my admiration. You know? well, don't say that because we don't want more calls <laughs> <laughs> of you trying to join. Yeah, no. Will you please join my board? No, no, <laughs> okay, no. don't do that, people. Don't do that. I get asked far too many times, and I, I just, I can't. I, yeah, that's not, that's not an opportunity right now, as we like to say. But an opportunity to meet Jack Gelato, certainly. Check ah. out the the, the uh, AFP conference coming up in Toronto. Amazing presenting sponsors that are here, and they include Marching Down This Field with us. It's it's amazing. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit a Profit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, Academy at National University, where Nacho Jackalotto meets us from, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Okay, Jack, you always, you know, you give me hope. For our sector, you give me intelligence, inspiration. I think you make, when they always say that hokey thing, put the fun in fundraising, I feel like you're that dude, you know, that you make it fun. <laughs> and so thank you so much. Thank you. I love talking with you. It's a lot of fun. Hey, every episode of The Nonprofit Show is fun. Sometimes we're more kooky than other times, but our intent is always there. And we end every episode with this message. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here next time. Jack, thank you so much, my friend.